Chapter 4. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers, the work of the hands of the potter? Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people is become cruel, like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the sucking child cleaveth to the roof of his mouth for thirst. 
the young children ask bread, and no man breaketh it unto them. They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment, and no hand stayed on her. Her Nazarites were purer than snow, they were whiter than milk, they were more ruddy in body than rubies, their polishing was of sapphire, their visage is blacker than a coal, they are not known in the streets, their skin cleaveth to their bones, it is withered, it is become like a stick. They that be slain with the sword are better than they that be slain with hunger, for these pine away stricken through for want of the fruits of the field. The hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. They were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of my people. The Lord hath accomplished his fury. He hath poured out his fierce anger and hath kindled a fire in Zion, and it hath devoured the foundations thereof. The kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem. For the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her, they have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that men could not touch their garments. They cried unto them, Depart ye, it is unclean. Depart, depart, touch not. When they fled away and wandered, they said among the heathen, They shall no more sojourn there. The anger of the Lord hath divided them. He will no more regard them. They respected not the persons of the priests. They favored not the elders. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. In our watching we have watched for a nation that could not save us. They hunt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near, our days are fulfilled, for our end is come. Our persecutors are swifter than the eagles of the heaven. They pursued us upon the mountains. They laid wait for us in the wilderness. The breath of our nostrils the anointed of the Lord was taken in their pits, of whom we said, Under his shadow we shall live among the heathen. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. The cup also shall pass through unto thee. Thou shalt be drunken and shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. He will no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. Chapter 5 Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us. Consider and behold our reproach. Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. We are orphans and fatherless, our mothers are as widows. We have drunken our water for money. Our wood is sold unto us. Our necks are under persecution. We labor and have no rest. We have given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. Servants have ruled over us, there is none that doth deliver us out of their hand. We get our bread with the peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. They ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hand. The faces of elders were not honored. They took the young men to grind and the children fell under the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. The joy of our heart is ceased. 
our dance is turned into mourning. The crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. For this our heart is faint. For these things our eyes are dim. Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever, and forsake us so long time? Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. But thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us.
said father we thank you for the bible study tonight thank you for your truth thank you for the gospel and thank you for the call you're giving us to come into the faith and to abide in the faith we pray that the grace to abide with christ in christ until glory you give to everyone in jesus name we're asking, Lord, that once again you open the spiritual eyes of everyone, that will behold the truth that you have reserved for us in your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3. We've been studying from chapter 1. And now we're in verse 13. Galatians chapter 3, reading from verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Be made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed be is everyone that hangeth on a tree. In verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Those two verses introduce us to what we're looking at tonight. As we look at the Bible, we have different dispensations and different eras from Genesis to Exodus chapter 2 you have the era or the period of the conscience 
They lived by their conscience. The law had not been written. The law had not been given to them. But the Lord implanted in their hearts, in their conscience, what is right to be done. And then from Exodus chapter 2, when Moses was born, until the end of the Old Testament, you have the era of the law. And the law was given to them. The Ten Commandments were written on the tables of stone. But then the other laws, like ceremonial laws and social laws, and their relationship with each other, based on the written law given to them. Everything was spelled out. There was nothing left for guessing or for imagination. This do, and thou shalt live. This, if you don't do, then you will die. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And then Christ came. And when he came, he brought not the law of Moses. He actually came to fulfill the law of Moses. And after fulfilling that law, he now brings us into the kingdom by faith. And that gives us the gospel, gives us the grace of God, and grace and faith work godliness in our lives. And so it is no more the law but faith. And faith deals with the promises of God. But the children of Israel did not know, did not understand when to come out of the law and to come into the promises of God by faith. That the reason they had much, much problem with the Lord Jesus Christ when he came. They were always looking back to the law. And Christ was bringing them to faith. It was telling them that now a new era, a new period, a new dispensation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Behold the Lamb of God. No more the lamb on the altars of the Jewish sacrifice. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the righteous, Jesus the Redeemer came. That he, not the lamb, not the animal, that he, Christ, is the one to save us from sin. And the promise is, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we're to come with that promise, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call by believing the promise of God, by having faith in the provision of God, we come into the kingdom and we come to Christ. And that is what transforms our lives. That whosoever be in Christ is a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Character becomes new. Lifestyle becomes new. And the disposition we have, everything becomes new because, not because we are in Genesis, the time of conscience, not because we are in Exodus chapter 20, all through to Malachi, the time of the Lord, but because we are now in the dispensation of grace. And the grace of God works in our lives. And we are now told, it is as we have that faith in the promise of the Lord, we come to the blessing of Abraham, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, not only Jews who want the law, but on the Gentiles. And then it says, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise, the promise of the Spirit, through faith, faith in Christ. That's why tonight we're looking at this passage, 
um, Galatians chapter 3 verses 13 to 29 I was looking at the superiority of the promise of faith the superiority now when you say superiority you are comparing two things that this one is higher than the other the superiority of the promise of faith above beyond the law of Moses three things we're looking at in the passage number one the promise of the spirit through faith the promise of the spirit there's no restriction here to the Jews or to the Gentiles the spirit of God coming to everyone alerting everyone teaching everyone bringing everyone out of what is past and bringing us to the very presence of God and we have the promise of the Spirit and we claim the promise by faith number two the prophecy on the siege and its fulfillment that the Lord had given the promise unto the seed singular not unto seeds as to the uh, different children in different generations of Abraham but unto the seed and that seed is Christ and then we have the fulfillment as Christ has come number three is the purpose of the schoolmaster in focus let's come to number one number one the promise of the spirit through faith we're coming to those two verses again Galatians chapter 3 reading from verse 13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law he has done it already when he went to the cross and when he died for us on the cross and when he said it is finished he has redeemed us from the curse of the law he has redeemed us from the condemnation of the law he has redeemed us from all the consequences of the broken law christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cause said is everyone that hangeth on a tree and what did he do that for us verse 14 again it says that the blessing of abraham might come the blessing of abraham might come on the gentiles through jesus christ that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith three things we're looking at number one the promise of salvation through faith in christ that we might receive the promise what promise the promise of salvation number two the possession of sanctification through faith and consecration the lord himself made provision for everything number one for our salvation number two for our sanctification through faith the faith we have in him when we come to him and lay everything upon the altar and consecration number three the power of the spirit for fruitfulness in his commission all that we have in the promise of the spirit salvation promise of the, of the spirit sanctification through faith and consecration and power the power of the holy ghost the power of the spirit for fruitfulness in the commission let's look at number one number one is the promise of salvation through faith in christ look at romans chapter 10 reading from verse 8 in romans chapter 10 verse 8 but what says it the word is nicely even in thy mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith which we preach for anyone to have salvation we must hear of christ as savior we must know the promise of christ our savior we must know 
have the process how to come into that salvation there are preachers who preach salvation but they'll spend 90 percent of the time talking about the law talking about sin talking about the evil in the world and then they spend maybe about five minutes and talk about faith that's not a good proportion we're talking about christ we're talking about faith we talk about the process by which the people come to the lord but if we preach sin 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 condemnation and guilt and the condemnation and the damnation and we spend all the time and then in passing we just say okay christ can save you come to the lord now that's not the that's not how to pre present salvation what says he the word is near thee even in thy mouth and in thine heart that is the word of faith we need to make the sinners know that salvation is available now and that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved we need to make them understand even if their tears were flowing even if they're rolling on the ground even if they felt sorry for their sin all that is not enough the word of faith which were preached look at verse 9 in verse 9 that if thou shall confess with thy mouth the lord jesus now a sinner may confess sin every day of the year and confess and confess and come back again i remember another one confess and for confess that's not what the scripture is saying the scripture is saying if you confess christ as savior as redeemer as the messiah if you confess christ as the one that links you up with the heavenly father he's a redeemer he's done the work already that he that shall confess with thy mouth the lord jesus and shall believe in thine heart that god has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved you see the mistakes of many they confess sin they don't confess christ the savior the redeemer the one who has died for us they have conviction about their sin about their guilt about their condemnation they do not have conviction about the christ who died and about the christ who was nailed to the cross and who took away all our sin look at verse 10 in verse 10 it says for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness not by struggling not by trying, not by turning over a new leaf the way have righteousness, but with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And look at that in verse 13 now. Verse 13 says, For whosoever, whosoever, those who have been deep in sin, high in sin, those who have gone far in sin, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, there are some people that even wonder, all these crusades we are having, and then we say you want to receive the Lord as your personal Savior, stand up there and raise up your hand. And then we say, come to Christ. And they don't cry. They don't roll on the ground. They don't feel sorry. They don't bring the remembrance of all the sins they committed from when they were very young until this time. They just stand up there and they say, yes, Lord, I give you my heart and I confess that now you are my Savior. And then the preacher assures them, you have called upon the name of the Lord. You are saved. You are born again. Because whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, Lord shall be saved and some people say uh, is that salvation can people get saved like that thank God for the testimonies we are hearing the people that their lives have been transformed and righteousness came into their lives because they confess 
Christ is now my Savior. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. I have the joy of salvation. I have the victory in salvation. I have called, and the word says, and I believe it, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's come to First Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God. We're saved. And in that salvation, we're kept by the power of God. And God has enough power to keep everyone that has genuinely come to the Lord. And we don't have to doubt, can this stand? Is it of any value? All these uh, things we're doing, uh, we're evangelizing, we're going out, and they say they have believed. Is it of any value? Of course, yes. Are they kept? Yes. Who keeps them? God, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time i pray that as we faithfully present the word of god the people will receive receive christ believe christ they'll be saved in jesus name look at number two here number two the possession of sanctification through faith and consecration it tells us in ephesians chapter 5 uh, reading from verse 25 ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 us must love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it the church is the ecclesia the church the people that are called out of sin called out of society called out of evil called out of the world of wickedness that's the church because they were called and they came out and they believed in the lord jesus christ they are the church now christ gave himself for the church why verse 20 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it that she might sanctify and cleanse it. Some people have little understanding about that word sanctify. And so God brings the next word to tell us what he means. Cleanse. He sanctifies. He cleanses. Some people say to be sanctified is only to be set apart. It's only to be removed from there to here. The salvation already, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are part of the ecclesia, you are part of the church that is called out, set apart. But the sanctification that Christ preached about after the disciples had been saved, and assured them their names were written in heaven. He now prayed and he said, Father, sanctify them, cleanse them, purge them, purify them, make them holy, that he might sanctify and cleanse it. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Sanctification is inward cleansing. The cleansing of the heart, the cleansing of the spirit, the cleansing of our mind, the cleansing of our thoughts that inwardly and outwardly, outwardly saved. All the external sins are taken away inwardly in our heart, in our spirit, in our soul, we are now sanctified and cleansed. It says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Look at verse 26, 27. The consequence of that sanctification. It says that he might present each the church unto himself. A glorious church, not having spot. That's what the sanctifying and the cleansing will do not have a spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that 
it should be holy. That's what sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. That's what it does, that it should be holy and without blemish. First Thessalonians chapter 5, reading from verse 22. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's salvation. That now you are born again, you are saved, you don't have any interest in evil anymore. You don't have, have any attraction to evil anymore. The evil of the world and the evil of the carnal nature does not attract you, interest you anymore. There is no magnetic field, magnetic current between you and evil anymore. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's salvation. After that, verse 23. In verse 23, and the very God of peace, the God of peace who had given you peace at salvation, the God of peace who had taken away the condemnation and the guilt and the confusion and the fear of eternal judgment, that God of peace now sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he will do it. I said he will do it. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Hebrews chapter 13, reading from verse 12. Hebrews 13 verse 12, wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people. Jesus also, also is Savior. He saved us. But then uh, that is not the end. Also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, the same blood that forgave us, that changed us, that redeemed us, the same blood that is shed on the cross of Calvary that saved us, that same blood is the blood that sanctifies us. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate, outside the gate. Look at verse 13. It says, let us go forth therefore, for that sanctification to be ours. Although he has shed his blood, we have to go forth unto him without the calm, bearing his reproach. Verse 14 says for here have we no continuing city but we seek one to come acts chapter 15 verse 9 and he put no difference between us and them between us jews and them gentiles god put no difference between us and them purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. That's how we get sanctification. That's how we get the purifying of their heart by faith. Let's look at number three here. Number three is the power of the Spirit for fruitfulness in His commission. It tells us in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Remember, remember that the promise of the Spirit is what we receive as we come to the Lord. Salvation, sanctification, and the power, immersion, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I, 
set the promise of my father upon you but tarry him in the city of jerusalem until ye be endured with power from on high tarry tarry in prayer tarry in consecration tarry in obedience to the lord tarry in making sure that there is no barrier between you and the fulfillment of the promise of god and you tarry in prayer you tarry by faith you tarry in total dependence on god until ye be endued with power from on high acts chapter 1 reading from verse 4 i've been assembled together with them he commanded them that they should not depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me verse 5 here is the promise of the father for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, for ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Those who are going to witness in Jerusalem must have the power of the Holy Ghost. Those who are going to get to Judea and minister in power must have the power, the immersion, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Those who are going to get to Samaria and they're going to witness effectively, they must have the power of the Holy Ghost. And those who are going to get to the uttermost part of the earth, to the end of the world, and to the people that live in the last hours of the last days of the dispensation, we must have the power of the Holy Ghost. That's why he says, we shall receive power after, not before. We shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. And then we're witnesses unto the uttermost part of the earth. In Acts of the Apostles, Chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 32. Acts chapter 5, verse 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. So also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. The Holy Ghost given to the believers who are saved, who are sanctified. And they obey the Lord in waiting, waiting for the Lord. The Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. Romans chapter 15. We're reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of of the spirit of god that's what we receive when we're baptized in the holy ghost immersed in the holy ghost so that from jerusalem and round about unto illyricum i have fully preached the gospel of christ we preach in the power of the spirit we're saved we're sanctified, we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, and we go in that power, reaching out to the world in the power of the Holy Ghost with the gospel of Christ. We'll come to point number two now. Point number two, the prophecy on the siege 
and its fulfillment. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 15. Brethren, I speak out of the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Now to Abraham and the seed, what the promise is made, he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Then in verse 17, it says, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, 430 years later, cannot disannul, cannot cancel, that it should make the promise of non effect. Then in verse 18, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. The inheritance we have, the heritage we have, the promise we have, the provision we have, if it be of the law, then it cannot be by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Then in verse 19, it says, Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgression. Till the siege, that's Christ, till the siege, till Christ shall come, to whom the promise was made, and was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. In verse 20, now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Verse 21, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could give, could have given life, eternal life, very little righteousness should have been by the law. Then in verse 22, it says, But the scripture has concluded all under sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The scripture has concluded all under sin that the promise by faith, the promise by faith, the promise by faith of Jesus Christ may be given to them, them, Jew or Gentile, them, everyone in the world, may be given to them that believe. That's the prophecy concerning the seed. And the Lord had prophesied that 430 years before the coming of the law, before the coming of of the law of Moses. It was promised that it is through that seed that redemption will come, that blessing will come, that the benefits that God had promised will come on the whole of humanity. It is through the promise I will receive the fulfillment by faith, not by the law of Moses. The prophecy on the seed and its fulfillment. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the identity of the seed, Christ. The identity of the seed, Christ. Number two, the inheritance through the seed, the confirmation. When Christ came, then the confirmation came. Number three, the interruption before the seed, the interruption before the seed, before the seed will come, before the conversion will come, 
before the new life will come, before Christ will enter in our lives, there will be conviction that I need him, conviction. All I am, all I do, all I struggle for cannot achieve salvation. There will be conviction that it is only him and him alone that can give me that salvation and that redemption there will be conviction the interruption before the siege conviction let's look at number one number one the identity of the siege in galatians chapter 3 verse 16 now to abraham and his siege were the promises made he saith not to seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. Would you know that when God was talking to Abraham back in Genesis, and he said, through thy seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Through thy seed, all the families of the earth will be saved through thy seed all the families of the earth will have the blessing of redemption he was talking about christ look at genesis chapter 22 verse 18 and in thy seed singular shall all the nations of the earth be blessed in thy seed the holy spirit now through paul the apostle tells us that seed is not isaac it's not jacob it's not the 12 patriarchs it's christ that's the identity of the seed and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice acts chapter 3 reading from verse 25 acts chapter 3 verse 25 ye ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which god made with our fathers saying unto abraham in thy seed you see that it's through Christ we have conversion, redemption, salvation, eternal life. He said unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Verse 26 tells us about the seed now unto you false God, having raised up his son, Jesus, that's the seed, that's the one that came, that's the one that brings us salvation now. His son Jesus sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from his iniquity. Christ has now come and he turns every one of you away from his iniquity in romans chapter one reading from verse three romans chapter one reading from verse three concerning his son jesus christ our lord which was made of the seed of david according to the flesh in verse four it says and declare to be the son of god with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead verse 5 by whom we have received grace by that christ by the seed by the savior the only savior of the world who have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name then in verse 6 among whom are ye also the called 
of Jesus Christ. That's the seed. By him, through him, we are called into sonship, into the family of God. Let's look at number two. Number two, the inheritance through the seed, the confirmation. We're coming back to Galatians chapter 3, verse 5. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 5, he therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Paul the Apostle always emphasizing that it is not by obedience to the law of Moses, it is by faith in Christ. Verse 17. In verse 17, and this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, later, cannot disannul that it should be made, it should make the promise of none effect. It was assuring the people that the law could not cancel the effect of the promise of God that the, pro the law came much later 430 years after the promise had been given and that the promise is still standing look at verse 18 in verse 18 for if the inheritance be of the law it is no more a promise but God gave it to Abraham by promise. He gave it to Abraham by promise. And it wasn't for Abraham alone. It's for the rest of the world. It's for all the families of the earth as we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 17. Hebrews 6, 17, wherein God willing more abundantly to show the heirs of promise, the immutability, unchangeableness, the permanence of his counsel confirmed each by an oath. Verse 18, it says in verse 18, that by two immutable that by two immutable things in the which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation or fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us we have strong consolation because of the confirmation of the promise of God and we can lay hold on that promise without any shadow of doubt because God cannot lie. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. It says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him. Who walketh all things after the counsel of his will. Verse 12 that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Everything is hinged on Christ. Becoming a believer, a Christian, an heir of the promise of God, a saved soul hinged on Christ. Receiving the blessings of Abraham and being counted a member of the family of God with real conviction, confirmation, and assurance based on Christ, who first trusted in Christ. Verse 13, in verse 13, in whom ye trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, in whom also, after that he believed, he was sealed 
of that Holy Spirit of promise. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet suitable to be partakers of the inheritance. Made us fit, suitable, meet, to become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Verse 14, in whom we have, not future, we have, because he died for us, we have, because he paid the price, we have, because the promise made to the seed has now been confirmed, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Remember, the moment you believe on Christ, you have that inheritance. You have the fulfillment of that promise. And the Spirit bears witness in your heart. You're now a child of God. There is a confirmation. Number three now. Number three, we're looking at Galatians chapter three. Reading from verse 19. It says, wherefore then serveth the Lord. It was added because of transgressions. This now came as an interruption to come in between. In between the promise that had been given to Abraham and then the seed, the coming of the seed, something comes in between. And it's the law that came in between the promise and then the provider, the fulfillment, the siege of that promise. Why was that added? Why did it come? Why the interruption of the law? It was added because of transgressions. Till the seed should come. Till the seed should come. And once the seed has come, then the law of Moses will go out of the way. It was there in the interim. It was there as an interruption. But now Christ has come. Now the Redeemer has come. Till the sea shall come to whom the promise was made. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of of a mediator that is that law was given through the mediation of the angels we're coming to second corinthians chapter 3 reading from verse 7 second corinthians chapter 3 reading from verse 7 but if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. That was the problem of the children of Israel. They saw that the law of Moses was glorious. An angel ministered unto them. And then the face of Moses was shining and they couldn't understand why that glorious sin will pass away, will be taken away. They didn't understand that something more glorious, the new covenant was now coming. And it, it says the ministration and the, the ministration of death, written and engraving in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance. Which glory? Ministration of death. Which glory? The law of Moses. Which glory? The old covenant was to be done away. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, 
how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? How shall not the ministration of the Spirit, that is, as Christ has come, and by the Spirit is revealed unto us, how will that not be more glorious than in verse 9? In verse 9, for if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more. Does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? Verse 10, for even that which was made glorious, Old Testament, Old Covenant, Law of Moses, had no glory in this respect by the real sin of the glory that excelleth. And then in verse 11, for if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. It's talking about the glory that has now come, which is what we have in Christ. Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 3. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. For what the law could not do, the law was deficient because of the nature of the people, because of the carnality of the people, because of the fleshly acts of the people, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Then in verse 4, it says, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The righteousness of the law is now fulfilled in us. We receive Christ and then Christ lives in us and the life we now live in the flesh we live by the faith of the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. He lives on the inside of us and then we'll walk by his light, we'll walk by his life, and we'll walk by his faith and we'll live the victorious life because he abides in us. We're coming to point number three now. Point number three, the purpose of the schoolmaster in focus. We're coming to Galatians chapter 3 verse 23. It says, but before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterward be revealed. It says, before faith came, before Christ came, and before we had real faith in Christ, we had the law. We were shut up under the law. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. That word schoolmaster, schoolmaster in the understanding of the Greek people was not the head teacher the headmaster or the proprietor. Those days, parents will have servants. Those servants will take the children to school. And the children, if they don't want to go to school, and they're screaming and crying, that servant will lay hold on them. He was referred to as the schoolmaster. He'll take them to school and force them to get to school. He was not the teacher. He was not the instructor. He was just the servant or the slave that will take that child and take that child to school. What he's saying is the law was the schoolmaster to convict us and to pinch us 
to condemn us to say you went wrong that way you went wrong that way you went wrong that way all the law is doing is acting as a schoolmaster to lay hold on our hand and to bring us to Christ that law that schoolmaster cannot save us cannot give us assurance of salvation cannot set us free cannot instruct us in the way of righteousness the schoolmaster was just to bring us to Christ through conversion sends us on our knees with conviction and then we pray and Christ himself the Savior, not the schoolmaster, the Savior now saves us from sin. Look at that verse 24 again. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. Number two, the sons that believe and become God's children. Number three, the sign of truly becoming, truly belonging to Christ. Look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. Already we've read, um, let's look at that again, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. 24. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Until we come to Christ, we cannot be justified by faith. If we are just with the schoolmaster, with the law, with the commandments, we cannot be justified by faith. It is when that commandment convicts us, drives us to Christ as Savior, and that schoolmaster, the law, brings us to Christ, the justifier, that we can now be justified by faith. Verse 25, in verse 25, but after that faith is come, after that we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. After that child in the Greek culture, at the first century, after that child had been taken by the schoolmaster, sorry, by the um, schoolmaster, uh, yes, to school and sat down and he's enjoying the teaching and now he wants the instruction, he wants the teaching. The schoolmaster is no more necessary because now that child has come to school and after we come to Christ, Savior, and we love him, and we listen to him, we enjoy his teaching, we enjoy his life, and we're now voluntarily, wholeheartedly disciples of Christ, and now we listen to him directly. We don't need Moses anymore. The greater one, greater than Moses has come. We don't need the lambs of sacrifice anymore. The final sacrifice, Christ, has now come. And we do not need any instructor of the priests, of the Levites anymore. Christ, the greater one and the greatest one, he has now come and will stay with him. That's what he's saying. After the faith is come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. He tells us in Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 7. Romans chapter 7, reading from verse 7. What shall we say then? If the lost sin, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known and lost, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, but sin... 
taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of evil of concupiscence for without the law without the law sin was dead verse 9 in verse 9 for I was alive without the law was but when the commandment came sin revived and I died Look at verse 24. In verse 24, O wretched man that I am. That's what the law does. The law makes you to understand you cannot save yourself. The law makes you to understand your resolution, your determination, your turning over a new leaf will not make any change. That's what the law does. It makes you to understand that in you there is no strength, there is no ability by yourself. As a man in nature, a woman in nature, there is no way you can obey the commandment of God by yourself you'll feel wretched you'll feel powerless and self and sin will dominate over you until the law holds your hand and brings you to Christ you'll be crying oh wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from this body from the body of this death the first part of verse 25 I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord the school master now brought me to Christ and I see he's my savior I see the one that can cleanse me and wash me whiter than snow is the one that can give me salvation forgiveness and freedom I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord I pray he'll do that in every life in Jesus name in Acts of the Apostle chapter 13 I'm reading from verse 38 be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man Jesus is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin verse 39 in verse 39 but by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses in him we have salvation we can't have that in Moses through him we have forgiveness and redemption we do not have that from Moses it says all that believe in him they are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses Romans chapter 3 verse 19 in Romans chapter 3 verse 19 now we know that what things soever the law saith, it says to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God that's the office of the law that's the essence of the law is to make everyone in the world guilty in the sight of God verse 20 in verse 20 therefore by the deeds of the law shall no man be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin verse 23 for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God verse 24 in verse 24 being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ in Christ Jesus were justified were saved were forgiven were redeemed through the Lord Jesus Christ it is the sacrifice of Christ the provision of Christ it is what Christ has done on your behalf on my behalf on our behalf and we believe that that gives us the freedom the forgiveness the salvation the redemption not the law of Moses but 
the efficacy of the sacrifice of Christ. In verse 24, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, 25 says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, not faith in your own ability, faith in your own, uh, you know, confidence, faith in self-confidence. It is faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission, removal, cleansing of sins that have passed through the forbearance of God. And then in verse 26, we're assured to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Point number two there. Number two, the sons that believe and become God's children. The sons that believe and become God's children. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Not by obeying the law of Moses, by faith in Christ Jesus. What we couldn't have for ourselves, possess in ourselves, do in ourselves, Christ has done that for us. And now we become the children of God. God by faith in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 16. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them. I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them. Come out from the natural people, the Jewish people, the people that depend on their own strength, and the people that depend on just religion, on the people that believe or depend on the old covenant, come out from among them. The people that are still living in sin, and they do not apply to Christ for salvation, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, repent and turn away from every Every sin in your life. Let the schoolmaster bring you fully unto Christ and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The Lord will receive everyone who comes in Jesus' name. In verse 18, and ye shall be, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, not those who are led by the law of Moses, not those who are guided by the old covenant, not those who are taken and they are being led by the Ten Commandments, but now as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. In verse 15, it says, for ye are for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And then in verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We are the children of God. We have repented, we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ has come in. He has made a great change, a great transformation in our hearts. And the Spirit is bearing witness. We are being led of the Spirit. We are living now according to the pattern of the life of 
of our Savior Jesus Christ, we are the children of God. First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. First John chapter 3 verse 1 behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not look at verse 2 it says in verse 2 beloved now are we the sons of god now before we get to heaven, we have to be the sons of God here before we go to heaven. That's the only condition that we come to faith in Christ and then our lives are transformed and we are changed. Now, are we the sons of God? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then in verse 3, it says, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The Lord will purge you. He'll purify you. And he will make your life what he taught to be as children of God by faith in Jesus' name. Look at verse 4 there. In verse 4 it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. In verse 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Then in verse 6 it says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. For whosoever sinneth has not seen him. Is seen living in the old life of weakness, neither known him. In verse 7 it says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that Doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. In verse 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested to come and do in us, to come and do for us, to come and do with us what the law of Moses could not do. The law of Moses could not change our person, our nature, our personality, our character. The law of Moses could not make us to walk in the way of the Lord. But now for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Then in verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God, God does not commit sin, for they, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We're reading verse 10 now. In verse 10, it says, In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God neither he that loveth not his brother. We'll come to number three. Number three here is the sign of truly belonging to Christ. The sign of truly belonging to Christ. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 27 for as many of you as are baptized into Christ, not baptized in water, baptized into Christ, immersed in Christ, I in you and you in me, that the Father may be glorified in me. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Verse 28, it says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. If you have been baptized into Christ, immersed in Christ, Jew or Greek, the same. There is neither bond nor free, slave or master. If you have been baptized into Christ, you are the same. There is neither male nor female, 
male saved, female saved, the same new life. It says, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. In verse 29, verse 29 says, and if ye be Christ, if you belong to Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We put on Christ. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23, Ephesians 4, Verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now we can come to Christ. Our minds that were dirty, our thoughts that were dirty, our inner life that was dirty, we can come to Christ now and the blood of Jesus will wash us whiter than snow. Amen. Amen. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then in verse 24, it says, And that you put on the new man. Get rid of the old man. That you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It's available for everyone. Everyone who comes, everyone who calls on him, everyone who believes on him, the Lord will take the guilt away, the condemnation away, the dirt away, and the impossibilities and deficiencies, take everything away, and he will give us his righteousness. And then we we'll put on the new man, which after God is created, a righteousness and true holiness. And through life, we'll be able to to live in the strength and the power in the grace of the Lord righteous lives and when he comes to take his son away he'll take you away to heaven I said he'll take you away to heaven and you'll be with him forever and ever in Jesus name I'll be there I'll be there rise up and tell the Lord and say Lord here I am I come. Here I am. I know what the law could not do. Christ has come and Christ will do it in your life. Pray and believe by faith we enter in.